Uh, our research was started because we're paraglider pilots and we actually started to see a lot of plastic in the air as we were flying. Okay, and, and when you were travelling through France, I understand as well, you perhaps uh, were surprised by the level of rubbish that was, in, uh, that was in the air. Did that immediately make you think, actually, there might be something more than, than what we're just seeing, the, the flying plastic bags? Yeah, there was a couple of uh, studies done by Kai and Driss on Paris and Dongwa in China that really uh, it started the ball rolling as to thinking about where it could, else, where it could be elsewhere. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Dioni, uh, what did you have to do in order to try and carry out the research that you needed uh, to do? What did that mean for your, for your lifestyle? Uh, did you have to relocate? I know the two of you are not uh, from France originally. No, we're not French. We're actually Australian. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so uh, this is part of a, a postdoc project that um, I was lucky enough to get with the uh, Ecolab uh, in Toulouse in France. Um, and the site that we're on is a long-term monitoring site. So they have a very good understanding of the atmospherics in the area and the water pollution through uh, groups like CESBIO and Ecolab, um, which makes this a perfect monitoring location. Mm. What does this mean, Dr. Joe, for us? Uh, when we're walking in the mountains in the Pyrenees, we assume the air is as fresh as, as can be. So what did you see that made you think, oh, no, it might be otherwise? We have some models around that, that are looking at uh, where microplastics are and how much they are. So sort of source to sink models. Um, we understand that pollution is coming out of urban areas, going into rivers, moving into the sea, that we have uh, plastic pollution uh, in the top of the sea and all the way through the water column into the sediment. But the balance isn't there. There are knowledge gaps and there are losses in the model that we have. Um, so we don't understand where this extra plastic is being lost. And the logical uh, thought process, if you've ever seen a plastic bag sitting in a tree or on a, um, a fence, is to think, well, actually, it's flapping in the breeze. The last place that we need to look is up. OK. Uh, Steve, how do these microplastics, we've talked a little bit about it, but how do they go from being regular plastics that we see to being these tiny particles? Well, the sun and uh, the environment will actually break them down into smaller pieces. They don't uh, disappear, they just get too small for us to see. Mm. If, uh, if we've obviously seen that they've gone from cities, which is where we expect them to be, to places like the Pyrenees. Does that mean that they could get to places as remote as Antarctica? Yeah, unfortunately this study was a bit short to show just how far they can go, but yes, we believe that there is nowhere left safe from microplastics. And yeah. the key point harm... from this... Uh... Sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the key point from this, uh, this study is that uh, these plastics are now atmospherically transported. So uh, we don't know how far they can go, but we know that the air transports them and could, that could potentially be anywhere. Now, of course, the idea of breathing in microplastics is not uh, one that fills anyone with joy. But why is it, is it harmful? Why should we be worried about these microplastics in the air? We don't really know what it does to us yet. There's, there's not enough research been done, uh, but there is quite a lot started recently to try and work out exactly what it's going to do to humans. We have an idea that it's not good for the environment, for animals and fish, but uh, we still don't know what it does to us.